Special greeting to uh, fathers, uncles, grandfathers, great-grandfathers um, on this special day. Well, in the liturgical cycle, this is Trinity Sunday. And I wanted to start with fathers because um, I have mixed feelings on Father's Day. Uh, it's partly due to my own uh, background, which was uh, at age two, my father took off and left my mother with my sister and myself. Now, fortunately, um, I have an outstanding mother uh, who's actually part of the Kenya mission team this year. She's going to serve in Kenya. Uh, but also, I was very blessed to have my uncle uh, step in and uh, do things like teach me to shave. You can see the success of that. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting the memories that you have. For example, uh, my uncle taught me how to tie my shoelaces. Uh, he would take me to uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, and I do remember 1967. <laughs> uh, we would sit up in the gray section, way, way up in, in the far corner. So when there were, you remember the grays. Um, and there were very special memories of that. And I remember um, uh, people in the scouting movement uh, who, again, as male role models, uh, played a very important role in my growing up. The other thing that happened to me was discovering Jesus. When I came to faith in Christ and picked up my baptismal vows that were made for me as an infant and discovered his love afresh, I discovered a loving heavenly father. Now, sometimes, you know, if you have not a great experience with dads, you could transfer that and think that God must be something like that. Of course, when we read the scriptures carefully, we see it's quite opposite. We read of uh, Jesus speaking of the Father and encouraging us to call him Abba, which might be translated as Daddy. It's a very familiar term. And uh, that's the kind of intimacy that God calls us into. And as I discovered that intimacy, God did several things in my heart. As I discovered the love of the Father, one of the things I had to learn to do was to forgive my earthly father. Um, I, deadbeat dad kind of comes to mind. Um, he didn't pay support payments, which made things very difficult for our nuclear family. And uh, that was one of the things I had to come before God. And I remember the Lord's Prayer. It's always been very powerful. Father, forgive us our trespasses. So as I discovered, God, you're forgiving my trespasses. Yikes. I've got to forgive those who trespass against me. And one of the uh, turning points uh, in my spiritual journey was that I, I discovered the love of God and God began to transform me through the Holy Spirit on the inside. I discovered that part of that transformation was learning to forgive my earthly father. And it was very interesting because emotionally, as I was able to do that, that provided immense healing. And so uh, Father's Day has all sorts of feelings and emotions. The other thing that that did for me was I was determined then that I would not continue the cycle. I was going to break the pattern. And that in my role as an earthly father, I was going to do my very best to be there financially and emotionally and spiritually for my children. You see, we can't always fix the past, but we can change the future. And God wants us to do that. So you see the implication as the Holy Spirit comes and transforms us. And this passage in Matthew 28 was very helpful for that because if you notice at the end here, as Jesus gives them the great commission to, the, to go into the world, he says, but I'm going to be with you always. No matter what you go through, if it's a cancer diagnosis, the loss of a loved one, a, a marital breakdown, loss of job, I will not forsake you. I will be with you always to the end of the age. It's a great promise and something that's given me great personal comfort through the years. Well, the Trinity on Trinity Sunday. What a wonderful complex uh, subject. You may have people come to your door and say, well, there's no mention of the Trinity in the Bible. And they're quite correct. There, you won't find the word Trinity. It's a theological term developed later by scholars who looked at the New and Old Testaments, and as they tried to describe God, 
they, they affirm several things. First of all, as we heard in the creed, they affirm that God is one. So Christians are monotheists. We believe in one God, but we say there is a trinity of persons. In other words, we experience God in three ways. God, the creator of the world. If you read Genesis, you also see the spirit of God, the Ruach, hovers over creation, is involved in creating the world. The Holy Spirit comes and transforms our lives as we encounter Jesus as the one who came as God's anointed Messiah and Christ. So we experience the three persons of the Trinity, Father, the Creator, Jesus, the Redeemer, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Sustainer. That might be ways. Now, I'll give you two small images, and you can speak to Ian after the service if you would like more information. Ian is a professor of New Testament, so uh, I bow to your wisdom. Uh, but two images I found very helpful. So when St. Patrick went to Ireland carrying the gospel, he picked up a uh, three-leaf clover. Now, this is quite close to me because I, I, one summer at camp, I actually went looking in the scavenger hunt for a four-leaf clover. Two hours later, I found one. <laughs> I don't know whether I looked at so many clovers, one eventually had four leaves. But... Um, he took the clover, which was common in, in um, Ireland, and said, look at the three. It's one clover, but there are three leaves joined. One God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Another image you might want to think of is that which we experience with water, H2O. We see it in three forms, and in fact, it is possible to see all three at once under certain conditions, where you have ice, and when ice melts, it becomes water. Continue to heat water, it becomes gas or steam. So uh, again, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, it's H2O, but we experience it in different ways. Now that's your theology lesson for this morning. But what I really wanted to uh, pick up on, besides Father's Day and the Trinity, is this call to go into the world with the gospel. Now we're commissioning the Kenya mission team and uh, we'll be sending a team to also Guatemala. Catherine, you're, you're part of uh, I'm going to stand up just for a second. <laughs> Thank you. Catherine, along with uh, Ahmed, is helping to co-lead the team to Guatemala in August. And you, you'll be doing house building amongst other ministry. Thank you. Uh, and so we praise God for those who go into the world to carry the gospel, not just um, as we do at the food bank and the backpacks for the homeless and a number of the other ministries, the Alpha Course, uh, which we do locally, but to carry the gospel also to the ends of the earth and partner with our brothers and sisters around the world. In our congregation, last time I looked, we had 29 different nationalities. I think there are probably more now. And I thank God that many people, God has worked in different places, different languages, all of our different cultural backgrounds, and yet God is real and working in his people and bringing people to discover his love afresh. And that happens because people have been faithful to the Great Commission to take the good news into their families, into their workplace. And by the way, there is a sign-up list for those who want to explore faith in the workplace. We'll be having a discussion group. How do you be a Christian in a workplace? And sometimes the secular work environment is not um, always conducive to having faith discussions, if you know what I mean. Some companies, it's kind of uh, taboo. And so uh, we'll be having a discussion group. If you'd like to be a part of that, please sign up. And we'll be talking about uh, strategies. How do we share our faith in the current uh, work environment in a way that uh, reaches uh, people uh, with love and respects um, them as well? And so God calls us into the world. Now, we're sending a team of 52 people to Kenya. And we have some representatives of that team here this morning. Uh, they'll be leaving on, um, on the 29th of June, and uh, they'll be undertaking a different task. And this morning, I thought just for a moment, I'd describe some of the things they're going to be doing. Some are going to be working with the dental team. We have a dentist and volunteers who have trained uh, to, to assist the dentists as they pull out teeth. Now, the first time I uh, was on a dental team, I, I still remember the first person that was in Sri Lanka. It was on one of the tea estates near Norelia. And the first uh, patient had 11 teeth removed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Susan's going. Um, but she was thankful because there, were, there was no dentist available and all the teeth had uh, abscessed. 
They couldn't be saved, and it was causing a horrific pain. So, so she experienced incredible relief. She got antibiotics and so on, as difficult as that was. In Bangoma area, where we'll be um, uh, doing some library projects um, in July, there's only one dentist for every 100,000 people. So um, you better know the string technique and the door. You, you know what I mean? You tie the string. Some of you have had that. And you slam the door. Um, so we, we kept seeing people coming, and they'd literally line up. We're talking hundreds of people lined up to come and get uh, free dental care. Uh, and some of the abscesses, I'm sure the dental team saved some lives because one of the people we saw had an abscess the size of a small softball on the side of his face uh, from one of the teeth. So uh, God's uh, going to bless the dental team. We've got a medical team who's going to go and give uh, free medical care and prescriptions and uh, some pharmaceuticals to help people. We also have a team that's uh, is, uh, putting together four elementary school libraries and shipped 4,500 books. I don't know if you can imagine what that looks like. That's a lot of books. They processed each one, and we're, we're told they've arrived in Kenya, and then, thanks be to God, they've been processed through customs. So they're awaiting the team to arrive. The libraries are gonna be put into schools that are in very, very poor areas. One of the places is Sheep Care. Uh, Sheep Care is a, a Christian school located in uh, Korogocho. It's part of um, a larger informal community or slum of at least 800,000 people. It's the largest slum in Africa. Uh, if, if you, uh, it's hard to imagine, but people living with, in buildings that they cobble together with plastic or cardboard or pieces of scrap metal, and they try to make a living and feed their family and do an amazing job with these very meager resources they have. But as a result, there's no money for health care or uh, education. Many of the kids can't go to school and so Sheep Care does a couple of things. Number one, they provide a lunch program because the parents otherwise would have to send their children out to beg or to try and sell things to make some money so they could be fed. But if the school offers a lunch program, the parents can send the child there, the child will be fed, and they will get the beginnings of an education. One of those libraries is going to go into Sheep Care. It's located right in the middle of one of the poorest areas in Nairobi. Now, in case you think that this is all um, happiness and light, on um, one of the visits, um, got to meet the godfather or the mafia head of the particular area. Um, if you've seen um, City of Joy, uh, the character who plays with Patrick Swayze, who plays the um, godfather mafia figure controlling the slum. I, I've met some evil people. This person would categorize as being very evil. Um, they had to go and ask permission for things to happen with that school and had to go and ask this guy that he would not destroy it. And he thought it was not a bad idea, it wouldn't cost him any money, so he said okay. It's like going to ask permission of the gangs before you can establish something. This place is dangerous at night. Many women experience sexual assaults in the area. Uh, people are very often afraid to go out at night because it, it can be very dangerous. Can you imagine living there day by day by day? And yet there are growing churches and very many faithful people working very hard. And we have a privilege to come and partner with these people uh, in what they're already doing and doing a wonderful job. So we are going to be blessed by uh, partnering with them and aiding in the development of medical and dental and library. Now, all sorts of things happen when you reach out um, in faith. When I, uh, last time I had a chance to be in Kenya, I worked with uh, Bishop Wabakala, now the primate of Kenya. Um, when uh, Bishop Wabakala has, is a rather spontaneous person. And so on, on a particular trip, we were going out to visit some of the rural churches, and I was with him in his car and his driver. And he said, oh, I've got to stop in on this meeting. Uh, would you mind if we just stop for about half an hour? I've been asked to say a few things and then we'll carry on. Well, the meeting he was stopping at was a meeting of two sides that had been killing each other for a number of years. There was a minor civil war happening on Mount Elgon, which is the border of Uganda and Kenya. And they had brought together the two sides which had been uh, killing each other very brutally uh, for quite a while. And there were, we walked in this room, one sitting on one side and the others are sitting on the other side. Uh, Bishop Wabakala prays for them, and then he turns to me and says, uh, Ken and Kim, would you say something to this group? <laughs> <laughs> he, 
Inwardly, I was thinking, thank you, Iliad. Uh, what am I going to say to people who have been killing each other in very brutal ways by hand? And uh, so I asked God to give me some words of wisdom, and some, some thoughts came. And I talked about our experience in Canada with trying to find resolution with residential schools and uh, Aboriginal land claims and trying to find justice for people where there's been dispute over land. And that it, how important it is that everyone feel that there be justice done. Otherwise, there can't be peace. So God gave me some small words from my own experience, not telling them what to do, but just um, our journey here in Canada in terms of dealing with that. And I know that's an issue in Australia, among uh, other places. By the way, it's also an issue in places like India, where there are large Aboriginal communities as well. Uh, the second experience I had uh, on this trip was we were interviewed by two television, um, the Kenya television broadcasting company, equivalent of CBC, sent uh, a television crew twice to do interviews with our team while we're working. Uh, but one of the other things I was invited to by Bishop Iliad was a live radio broadcast. So we get into the studio, and I'm with one of the most popular radio broadcasters in Kenya. His listening audience is 5 million people. And so we're sitting in the studio, and I'm kind of enjoying it, and uh, I thought I was along for the ride, just to, to see what's going on. And Bishop Elliot is doing a, a great job with um, uh, carrying the interview in English and Swahili. And uh, suddenly the host turns to me and says, Ken and Kim, it's great to have you with us. You're from Canada. I just wanted to ask you, um, if you were to give some advice to our president, who's at State House, you were invited to see him, <laughs> what would you say to him about how to run the country? <laughs> this was my experience. I, I sat there, and the first thing that came to my mind was, I better be really, really careful what I say if I want to stay in this country much longer. Uh, because um, I could be on a very quick tr plane ride out uh, if I say the wrong thing. The second thing was, I don't want to say something that's going to embarrass the local church. Now, as these thoughts are going through my mind, the host said, oh, hang on, we've got a break for a commercial. <laughs> so I had about two minutes uh, before we went back live. And I, I remember praying, and the Holy Spirit gives you guidance. And I prayed, Father, give me the right words to speak. And I said, um, you know, it, I'm a visitor to your country. It's not for me to tell your president how to run Kenya. But what I, I said, but what I can say from my own experience of visiting a number of countries, and in fact, in my own country, that one of the things that we struggle for as Canadians is to make sure the tax money that's raised from taxes is properly used to benefit the health care and education and roads of all Canadians. And the better that we accomplish that, the greater blessing for the people. And I think that was the right thing to say at that time. It got at the whole issue of uh, corruption uh, that, that's part of uh, the framework in Kenya and, and many other countries, including our own. Uh, but it also got at it in a way that didn't cause offense, but people could hear what was being said. And that's the Holy Spirit. When you reach out in mission, God will give you the words to speak when you trust him. Now, we need your prayers because on June 29th, the team's going. Uh, God's going to lead us into all sorts of new situations, and I have no idea. I can, I can tell you I'm a little bit apprehensive because um, last time I visited uh, Archbishop Wabakala I, for his house for lunch, the president of Kenya lives next door. Had we, I, I, I keep wondering this time whether he's actually going to uh, drop in next door to visit the president, and I'll get a chance to meet uh, some of the top people. And then the whole question is, you know, what do you, how do you conduct yourself uh, in, in a way that's, and the conversations you might have and opportunities. So uh, last time I, I was tempted to look over the fence and see if the guy was doing any gardening, you know, next door. Uh, but God opens these opportunities as we reach out, and God will do the same thing in Guatemala as the Guatemala team goes forward, and also in your workplace, in your family, reach out, be praying that God would give opportunity and wonderful things will happen. Now Cassie is going to be doing computer training uh, with the staff in Tanzania. 
And uh, she's going to be teaching um, and working with the uh, diocesan staff there to teach them computer programming and using her skills. Other people in Tanzania are going to be laying, working with the local churches to build concrete floors in the churches. And we hope that about seven churches will have uh, the buildings finished in partnership with our team. And so God's going to do great things and we look forward, but we need your prayers for safety and protection as we reach out in faith. May God bless you as you celebrate Father's Day, as you remember the blessing of our Heavenly Father as part of the Trinity, and as you reach out to obey the Great Commission.